Very good. Why don't we bring the house lights back up a little bit for our q and A? I think it's good to engage a little bit more. I think we got Father Joe on the way up with Randy as well. That's good. That's good. <laughs> All right, look, Randy grabbed the mic first, so that's perfect. And this is just to make sure you're paying attention at Mass, Randy. I don't know who put it in here, but it's a good question. What's your favorite quote of St. Joseph? We got uh, the handheld. Got it. Go. He says you're on. I was, just, I was, I was paying attention. Uh, St. Joseph, what? Does, we don't have any words for St. Joseph. Do we? I think we do. <laughs> I got green lights. We got green lights. Okay. Yeah, I was paying attention. There are no words from St. Joseph. Uh, for what it's worth, it really did say that was for you. Sorry, Randy. Praise God. They're trying, to, they're trying to mess with you. All right. Uh, <laughs> There were two ones that I think come really from your heart as a father and your heart working with Life Team. I'm going to put them together. They're two different questions, but if you would go with both, both of these. What do you recommend, uh, how would you recommend structuring family prayer for kids that are 10 or younger? What is a resource to get teens interested in scripture? Yeah, family prayer, um, you, you don't, uh, especially when they're younger, you just want to get into the rhythm of prayer. So one of the things that we do, like when uh, we're leaving our house and driving out of the neighborhood, we immediately start a prayer right while we're driving. It's uh, just a, a normal thing for our family when we're leaving the house. Um, and then we have a Monday uh, rosary, and we, the younger ones will start with like one decade of the rosary. Um, but they tend to, as, as they get older, they, they want to stay for the entire rosary. Um, and then really important um, for meals... Like, really make saying grace an important thing, mm -hmm. even in public. Mm -hmm. Letting them pray in public uh, at a restaurant. Um, and then when they grow up, and thank God for um, some of our kids, they, they're really, they still do that. Even with now with their friends, they'll go out and they'll pray in public at a restaurant. You know, cool. they, some, some that keeps with them. So I think it's just being in a rhythm of prayer. Yeah. Um, I don't want to be a self-promote of resource that Life Teen's done, but as far as getting teens interested in the Bible, Life Teen has a, a fantastic teen Bible. And a lot of Bibles for young people try to be the catechism and the Bible, but the Life Teen Bible is geared just for young people to get a rhythm of reading the Bible and diving into it. So there are 60 pages that we've added. Um, Mark Hart, who's uh, our Bible geek who works with Life Teen, he put those pages together. It's a great resource for teens uh, to, to start them on a journey of reading the Bible. We get um, parishes and teenagers write us all the time about how they now have a rhythm of reading the Bible by getting that Bible. So that would recommend that. You can get it on our Life Teen website. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, Father Joe, what was that prayer again? Someone put in here, your, the prayer you had us pray together. The prayer is, let me think of it. <laughs> Jesus, help me allow you to love me. So it goes me, you, me. Jesus, help me to allow you to love me. Praying, just starting with the holy name of Jesus is such a powerful way to pray. Very good. R Rudy, how did it go with the high school kids? Did they have any idea who you are? <laughs> yeah, they do. Actually. All right. It's funny. They uh, show the movie uh, a lot of health classes. We're finding out. Kids have grown up with the movie with the family, so that's a good sign. It's in generations. Yeah, cool. Uh, Randy, this must have been written after your dance, all right? <laughs> Do you ever, are you ever afraid of rejection from your, your kids or your family when you put yourself out there? How do you deal with that fear? Huh, being rejected by, like, my own kids? I'm, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to guess that was a father's heart writing that. You're afraid to be too Catholic or something, right, you know? You got to answer next because you got kids too, all right? <laughs> you know, um, we never, we never like, um, we just make the faith very exciting for our children, and then they pick up on that. So we've never had to like force them to go to youth group or like to life teen or or edge or whatever they you know for our um, kids. They've kind of 
fallen into that rhythm of it. Um, I, I think one of our roles as a dad is sometimes we we're expect. I mean, my dad embarrassed me, and I kind of <laughs> feel like it's payback time, right? You know. So, um, in some ways, you know, being active in the faith. Um, like when I was coming up here and I'm like, hey, I'm speaking and, you know, Rudy's going to be here. And, and my kids are all like, dad, you've got this. You'll nail it. You'll kill it. You know, it'll be awesome. And they're, they're encouraging to me. So um, I think they expect me to say the dadisms and dad jokes the way that I do. But for the most part, um, they see just by how I try to authentically live my faith. That's my prayer, that by how I authentically live my faith, that it's something that they don't reject, but they embrace and they, as I said in my talk, they really are watching us, and that example we set goes a long way. So uh, we don't really joke too much about faith things, but we have we have fun with some of the dadisms that right, I do. Right, sure. Again, being a dad, you had great connections with the teens yesterday. What's how's that like when you're a public persona? Yeah, it's interesting. I have a uh, I got married when I was 50. I have a 17 year old daughter and a, a 13 year old son and I asked the kids, how old is Rudy now? <laughs> and they think, oh, 67 Rudy. I said, oh good. Yeah, I'm gonna be 68. And uh, then I, you know, when we go to drive him to school in the morning, that's where we have our kind of like our special time uh, together because it's quiet. They're more worried about the homework they didn't do or or the girlfriend that they didn't talk to, or whatever, or the boyfriend. So it's time to bring in, you know, the, I call the God loop to them in a way, because when I tell them the Rudy stories, they think I'm corny. So what we do, I listen to them, and when I pick them up, this is what's awesome. I see a guy begging for food with his can, and I ask my son, my son actually taught me this lesson, he says, Dad, you think that guy's real? And I said, what do you think? You think he's real? Yeah, I think so. I said, what, what do you think Jesus would do? He said, well, go give him uh, two bucks. I said, all right, give him two bucks. So I gave him two dollars. The guy took the money, put it in his pocket. And now uh, he said, Dad, ask him for a dollar back. Tell him you need gas. I guess he learned this in school. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, can we have a dollar back for gas? He reached in his pockets, gave us a dollar back. People with nothing give. The guy had nothing, but he gave back. It was a wonderful lesson, but that's the spirit. That's my son's being taught in school. You don't judge people for what they don't have. It's their heart. And I think that's what we really lean on is like if you're, uh, and I don't mean to go on and on, or if we're coaches and teachers, please. The words you say to these kids is so devastating. If you say a, a, a word of, to just, not to empower, but to take their dreams away, you could ruin them for life and they can think because they respect you. So remember that. So coaches play a big role, teachers play a big role, dads play a big role, but dads are corny to the kids. But coaches are real, teachers are real. So if you're saying something and the coach says something positive, then dad's okay. You got it? Thank you. <laughs> you can hear in that question, you know, like, what if my kids reject me? There's a fear hiding in that question. There's two or three in a row that, that do that in a similar way. I'm going to summarize them and hand this off to Father Joe, so get your brain working on it. So the, another one right after that says, I'm a workaholic. I know that's caused a lot of pain to my family, rejection at times. Another one says, I, I hear a call to lead others. To, to God and, and, and his love, but I'm little in knowledge of faith. The question goes on. They're all similar. Do you have any concrete suggestions to help others uh, who are fighting against those fears, those voices that you're not cool, you're working too hard, you cause pain in the family? So I know your talk was a lot on this topic, but... Sure, so uh, John 10, 10, we, I, I often, and I think we often emphasize, John 10, 10 says, I came that you may have life and life to the full. Before that, it says, the thief comes only to steal, to slaughter, and destroy. I think Rudy was touching on this, the voices. So what, what voices do you listen to? And I spend a lot of time in, you know, I also have the luxury because I'm a priest, in quiet prayer. 
just listening to the voice of God. So this is just a very important principle. The voice of God is always the voice of affirmation, never of negation. The voice of the evil one is always the voice of negation, never of affirmation. So God always wants to speak to you about your deepest identity. He always wants to say, I love you. I'm proud of you. I like you. <laughs> um, sometimes that's harder to hear than I love you. He always wants to speak affirmation to you. Affirmation is the essence of love. To say to another person, it's good that you exist. And I don't know about these guys, but very often in my prayer, when I ask something specific, God will say something like, you know, like God, this or this, or I say something and God says, well, I love you. And I'm like, well, that's not the answer that I wanted, but it's the answer I needed. Um, so he, he, to listen to his voice, it's whose voice are you listening to? Am I listening? And this was a lot of Rudy's talk. Uh, am I listening to the voices of negation or the voices of affirmation? Just the, the subtle whisper of the Holy Spirit to begin to pray silently. And some of the ways you can do that are to be in your car in silence, to turn off the talk radio, to not watch Fox News or CNN, to cultivate silence in your life because the Lord speaks in silence. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening, right? That's the prayer. I don't know if that's Joe, what you want to pray? That's good. Randy, too. Yeah, just one, one part of that question was about if you don't really feel confident in your faith, mm -hmm. how, do you, like, how do you talk to your kids? Working with teenagers for years, what they want is people who are authentic. People that ne don't necessarily have all the answers, but people who will seek the answers with them. So I wouldn't be afraid if, like, if there's a question that they ask you about the faith that you don't know. Um, go journey with them and get them that answer, but be authentic. They can smell somebody who's being fake with it or trying to fool them a mile away, way before we as adults can. Teens can really read people. So just be authentic with them, and they, they really respond. It's amazing you answered that. I just skipped this question as it went by. Guys, how do you stay relevant during everything that changes? Be authentic. Nice. Glad I skipped the question. <laughs> uh, what is your daily strength, the number one help in regards to your own faith? Why don't each of you take that? Daily strength, number one help in regards to your faith. Start off yeah, don't start with Father Joe. He'll say yeah, the mass, right, and you're right, like, right. oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd start off with, thank you, Lord, for another day in paradise. That's the first thing. Because I'm, you know, alive again. I have my moments. And that really starts to stay off in a positive way. And then you got to go walk the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may be stealing Father Joe's thunder here. But um, a, a few years ago, I was, um, I, it, it's, it's probably been 15 years now. A woman came up to me after Mass. Um, and she said, Randy, I go to daily Mass and I notice that you don't really go. And she said, somebody in your position should really, I'm kind of surprised that you don't take advantage of the graces of going to daily mass. So I started going to daily mass. And at the beginning, um, I was in awe of everybody there because I thought they were so holy and because they, they went to daily mass. And then after going to mass for uh, a while with everybody, I realized it was because everybody there realized how unholy were, they were and they needed to go. And so it's that realization each day. So I strive to to go to daily mass every day, um, and that really grounds me. And, and know, wow, you just received the body and blood of Jesus. How can your day get? How can it be a bad day, right? And it's, it gives a perspective on it for me. So that's really um, diving into going to mass each day. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Real quick, just to add yeah. to the obviously mass for me, a personal prayer time in the chapel. I, so I, I've made the commitment to do an hour every day. But whatever it is to get a small amount of time, even if you start with five minutes, um, to start with five minutes of personal prayer, uh, so important. Daily Mass is amazing, and you can, that's obviously more than five minutes, and it's, it is the most contemplative and the most beautiful prayer. I'm going to use one that has kind of a year of mercy, adding a little bit to it, if you don't mind. There's two that would go together. One lists... How do you pray for enemies when there's terrorism and killing and, you know, that goes on? Works of mercy in general. Um, what does it actually mean to be merciful? <laughs> nice. So, um, 
So let's just talk about divine mercy for one second. So the word mercy comes from the Latin word misericordia. Cordia, you know, is from the word where we get our word for cardiac, which means heart. Miseria is where we get our word for misery. And so when we talk about the divine mercy, it's literally in the word is the definition is that the cordia, the heart of God, is reaching down and touching our miseria, our human miseries. And that's what becomes mercy. That forgiveness is what we call mercy. And so I, one, of, one of the biggest prayers, I, I taught you guys that other prayer, but it's great to be merciful for our own health, right? They've done all these sociological studies to say how great it is to forgive um, each other. The greatest reason to show mercy and the way to become merciful is to contemplate the one who's been merciful to you, right? So one of the prayers I pray all the time is, Jesus, place the forgiveness that's in your heart in my heart. And that's the forgiveness from the cross where the Lord says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's He's seeing his blessed mother spat upon and yelled at and screamed at. And he's hanging from a cross when he says that. That's the mercy. Jesus, place the forgiveness that's in your heart and my heart. Let me just say this because I think it's so important for guys. Sorry for talking. Self-forgiveness, guys. Self-forgiveness. To forgive yourselves. To be able to say, Jesus, in your name, I forgive myself. I forgive myself. Self-acceptance. Our ability to love is freed when we see ourselves as good, worthwhile, and lovable. We've got to forgive ourselves. So often we beat up ourselves, and we, I try and become more loving to Randy. I've got to forgive and love myself, and that will free me to love, to love others. Beautiful. Just thinking about the society as a whole that we live in right now, it's a lot of individualism and isolation. How can men help men fulfill their roles as men? We'll take, each of you take a crack at that one if yeah, you don't mind. How can men help men fulfill that role as a man? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one, I, I think having the confidence in yourself as a human being, what, what your faith is, the true meaning of a man and as a woman as well. Uh, to be a man, you must accept forgiveness. You must forgive. And the day you're hurt, you must forgive the day you get hurt. And I say that from experience. I had something bad happen to me. Someone used my name in a bad way, and I got, uh, because of the responsibility, whatever. But he got cancer, and he uh, calls me and uh, apologizing to me. I said, son, I already forgave you the day you did it. So go die in peace. I think that's a man when you could do that, when you could forgive. I think that's the key, when you could forgive. I like the forgiveness is the key because we cannot live hating each other or, or, or looking at the negative. Just forgive and move on. That's the man. Cool. Another part of this question, I should have repeated that too. In the world of individualism and isolation, the Marlboro man, I can do it myself. You know, how do men help men? Yeah, I think of the scripture where there's the paralyzed person that's carried in on a mat and they can't get him in the house and they take the roof off and they, they lower him down. And I, I think the question for us is, um, do we have people in our life that would carry us to the Lord if we, we were that person that we were paralyzed? So for me, it's been having uh, men that are like accountability that journey with me. You know, in ministry, the more you're trying to lead people closer to Christ, the more resistance you have. You know, I can almost lean into it on a daily basis. And if there aren't people that I'm praying with and that are holding me accountable, um, and even to this point where we said, hey, I'm, I'm in Syracuse and I'm in a hotel room and I'm struggling, can you come? That we made an agreement that they would jump on a plane and I would do the same for them. Um, you know, as a way to hold each other accountable and be strong in our faith. Um, so I think you know, have people in your life, whether it be a Bible study, a men's group, and I know one of your goals of this with the small group questions, maybe that would carry back into parishes and that type of thing. I would totally encourage that. Um, there's just a great thing about men getting together. And even if it's a group of you that like to play golf together and, and go do that. And, you know, the, the, being around guys that are all striving for holiness really helps you stay on track. Yeah, I, I agree. When uh, parents often ask me to pray for their kids, I very often I will pray that their kids would have good friends. C.S. Lewis said, you want to know a man's character, look at his friends. So we often go the way of our friends. So 
good, holy friendships, cultivating that. A few years ago, I've always been blessed with good friends. A few years ago, I was saying to the Lord, I kind of felt, I don't know, a little bit lonely when I first came back to Pittsburgh or something. Lord, give me good friends. Give me good friends. And I heard the Lord say, Joe, be a good friend. And then it will happen around you. Awesome. Well, fellas, I want to thank you very much for being generous with your time, the gifts, sharing your journey, sharing your love of the Lord. And, and the uh, shirts that were available, our theme today was merciful like the Father. Thank you for showing us and being the face of that mercy to each one of us. Thanks, guys.